So if the Japanese market goes down, Asahi chemical goes down, while if the US market goes up, Dow chemical goes up. Although on a global basis, they compete directly against each other in many markets. But still, the stock price follows largely national markets. So national nationality in stock markets still matters. Third, there is no evidence for a trend to say idiosyncratic risk, that means unique risk, the risk of that particular stock or that particular market. In any of the countries examined, is, has an upward trend. Uh, it jumps around in, uh, unpredictably. Um, so, somebody has made, now you say, how can we actually implement this on a realistic basis? And the answer, ladies and gentlemen, is another financial innovation. And that is, in many markets now, we have the so-called exchange, tra the index, the exchange traded index funds. First of all, people have discovered that, that it's awfully difficult in well-organized, well-controlled, well-supervised, regulated markets, where people are forced to disclose where there is little inside information, that basically it is awfully difficult for fund managers to beat the market. As you, you all know these studies that show that every year, 40% of the funds beat the market, 60% are below the market. The problem is the funds that beat it last year will not beat it, are unlikely to beat it the, the next year. And there is another innocuous thing. As a director of one of fund management companies, I've learned a lot of tricks. One trick is that <clears throat> my job as academic is to keep them honest and to disclose. In the US, that's a good thing, and we'll keep you within the law. Um, one trick, which is quite legal, is that the fund company sets, starts, let's say, in any year, let's say, 10 funds, large fund com complex. Four beat the market, three do, four do so-so, and two do miserably. Guess what happens? The two that do miserably are being closed. The next year, we add some more funds. Again, four beat the market, four do so-so, two do miserably. It may well be the ones that are, did very well in year number one. What do we do with them? We close them. That means in our advertising, we only show what? The good ones. The bad ones are down. In academia, we call that survivor bias. You only see the ones that survive. Which, of course, because by luck, they did well. Um, I have never understood, frankly, why somebody else would beat his or her brain out to make money for me. They only make money for themselves. So I'm very skeptical maybe too skeptical of the financial industry. If there are any remisiers or fund managers in here, I beg your forgiveness if I'm a little bit too, uh, too uh, uh, outspoken. But since I'm Anglo, I don't have to be terribly polite. So I can afford to do that. <laughs> OK, uh, here somebody took the trouble and saying, you know what these academics do with their big databases? I can, as an individual investor, I cannot do myself. But how can I approach that? Well, one of the big attempts in order as a counter movement, because one academic study after the other came out with basically the mutual fund industry cannot outperform the market, partially because of their fees. The costs are significant. A mutual fund costs you what? at least one to two percent, right? In Singapore, particularly bad because we have these international funds which are then Singaporeized, which means effectively, if you read the prospectus, you pay two fees, the Singapore fee and the international fee. And the international fee run about between a percent and one and a half percent, right? On an equity, on a managed equity fund. And that means, now you say, well, I compare that to the return of the funds, it's quite modest. The fund last year did six, seven, eight percent. No, 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 that's not how it works. Because you're comparing apples and oranges. The six or seven or eight percent fund performance, ladies and gentlemen, is what? That's a risky rate, right? Nobody guarantees you that. 
and it may be six, seven, eight percent in a good year, but it may be negative in a past year. The 1.5 percent, however, is what? That's a riskless rate. You pay that no matter what. And therefore, to properly compare that, you have to compare it with a riskless rate. And the riskless rate it return in most markets is somewhere where in what vicinity? Uh, between in mature markets like Europe and the US, it's about 3%. In growing markets, emerging markets, and Singapore still is there, is about 4%. But still, you tee away 1.5% of, if you're lucky, a 4% ri riskless rate of return. That, to me, is a substantial amount. And this is why I like index funds. Because I don't, I leave it to other people who have more confidence in the financial industry than I have to make the markets efficient. I mean, somebody has to beat their brains out and say, and translate all the information that comes into prices. The markets are not efficient by an action of the good Lord. But because there are people who believe, they can collect information and translate it into prices. The people who spend their days in front of a TV screen as professional traders, usually with a financial institution, sometimes at home, but not very often. Because the home office lacks the total information that you get in a large trading room. Anyway, I, let, I personally let other people play these games. I'm happy to make the index and buy the index fund with a charge of a tenth of that, 16 basis points, 22 basis points, in that vicinity, that's what we're talking about. So there are a number of proxies, in other words, country funds, that are available in the US markets and others. So for example, if I want an exposure to Europe, I buy IEV. I don't have to worry about which bloody European bank, uh, company I should buy. I have other things to do besides worrying about European stocks. If I have a good portfolio of 350, that's rep representative, that somebody who, know, who studies the markets reasonably well, like S&P or somebody who does that, they have their analysts, they look what are representative stocks. That's good enough for me. So my exposure, personal exposure to Europe is satisfied with IEV. I don't have to worry about which European bank. That's 350 stocks. The others are very similar. And so basically, and now again, you can have almost for every market, except exotic ones, you can see here India, there, that's still wild and woolly. There may be somebody who knows India well and who knows the company and lives there and works 14 hours a day think, trying to figure out the good ones from the bad ones, uh, they probably can outperform the general market. And so I'm not much for index investing in exotic markets. But for all the mature markets where you want to be in the begin with, there are today exchange traded index funds. Now we have to say something about ETFs. ETFs, because the basic idea is very good, have become a fact. I just looked at uh, yesterday in preparation for this talk, I looked at how many ETFs we have in the US and there are 690 listed. I can tell you that of those 690, I wouldn't touch 650, maybe even 670. Why? Because it doesn't make any sense. Why do I need an ETF on pharmaceuticals? Why do I need an ETF on housing loans? Why do I need an ETF on this industry or that? And nowadays, they even sell you ETFs on, that are leveraged. I can do my own leverage, right? Um, basically, the only ETFs that make sense to me are based on broad indices. S&P 500, Russell 3000, if you want exposure to the US market. And here, of course, we have the SP 100. A wonderful <coughs> instrument, cheap. 16 basis points, or something like that, that State Street argues. I ask, I don't ask, I just ask hypothetically. Which one of you has put them into his or her CPF account? Don't have, don't have to raise hands.